It's the Second World War. Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia were at opposite ends, fighting for the Baltic Sea territory. The German U-boat U-479 was operational in the Baltic Sea and is rumoured to have been on a secret mission. Would it be possible to find the lost boat? Hunt for U-479. But it's not only wars that create shipwrecks. Baltic Sea is a hazardous sea, with extreme weather and shallow waters, thousands of islands and rocky shores, and harsh winters when thick ice covers the northern coastlines. The environmental conditions are also unique. The water is cold and the saline levels too low for most marine species to survive, including corals and the shipworm that everywhere else destroys shipwrecks in no time at all. Baltic Sea is filled with well-preserved wrecks. It's a treasure trove for any diver or archaeologist. This adventure started a long time ago, far, far away. It's winter time. We are in Finland in the suburbs of Helsinki, visiting our old friend, Yari Lintukankari. Gary is an engineer and a diver, interested in the maritime history. And for years, Gary's been thinking about a Second World War collision between a Russian submarine Lembit and a German U-boat U-479 that got lost in the Baltic Sea at the end of the Second World War. Wouldn't it be great to try and find the boat? And wouldn't that make a great documentary film? On the 15th of November 1944, German U-boat U-479 was on a secret mission in the Baltic Sea. After sending its last radio message, it disappeared without a trace. Yari talked about this incident to his old friend Kimo Kursniemi, who is a film director and a musician. Kimo is also Finnish, but he's lived in England for years. The German U-boat U-479 is carrying out short missions at the Eastern Baltic Sea. Lembit, a Russian submarine, is patrolling the Finnish waters. There was a lot of underwater activity in the Baltic Sea during the Second World War, and the Germans also used these shallow waters as a training ground. These boats were on a collision course. It is a reported fact that the Russian submarine Lembit hit an unidentified object. Was it the U-479 that sank into the depths of the Baltic Sea? Lembit is slightly damaged and after surfacing reports that it has seen oil and German debris floating on the sea surface. Could it have collided with the German U-boat U-479? After the incident, Lembit went to Helsinki, Finland for repairs. Over 60 years later, we search for the truth. The Baltic Sea is way up there in Northern Europe. The English name Baltic Sea is slightly misleading. It's not only surrounded by the so-called Baltic Sea states, but also Germany, Poland and Russia. 
and the Scandinavian, Sweden, Denmark and Finland. The locals don't necessarily call this water the Baltic Sea. For the Finns, Swedes and Germans, the Baltic Sea is the East Sea in their native tongues, and the Estonians logically call it the West Sea. From a filmmaker's point of view, it's hard to make a film about something that might have happened and what could be found. What if we never find the U-boat? So we started to think, and the more we thought, the bigger the idea got. When Kimo and his partner Tanya got back in the UK, the ball started rolling. How do we approach this? We are professional filmmakers, born and raised by the Baltic Sea, but complete novices in diving and anything to do with filming underwater. Divers of the thought, look, I do a talk with this guy, leave this up here in the UK, and he gave me some pointers. Sounds like a big bite. We needed help, but we need people to interview. Do you remember where the map is? And then there's a long ferry to Tallinn Strait across the Baltic. Oh, hi guys, yeah, just a second. Hey, Tanya, we have a connection to Sweden. Hi guys, we can hear you perfectly. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hi, my name is Kim Up. Hi, my name is Tanya, good to see you. How are you guys? We're fine, thank you. We're fine. Fine. Yeah, no, well, basically we are two Finns living here in UK. We've been here for 16 years and uh, we are filmmakers and musicians. We've done... So can you tell us something about yourselves? My name is uh, Lotta, Charlotte Kellian, and I've been diving. My name is Pag, by the way. I... <laughs> yeah, my name is Thor and... Uh... We have been doing quite a lot of underwater filming for the last five years or so. I think we're pretty good doing what we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, the investigation begins in Stockholm, Sweden. Kimo and Tanya flew to Stockholm, while Yari took the ferry to Tallinn where the now Estonian Lembit submarine resides. We came to Stockholm to meet our diving team, and here they are in person. Per, a calm and focused sympathetic shrink, a real-life partner to Charlotte, and a diving partner in the group. We couldn't have done this series without his strength and technical know-how. Charlotta, smiley Lotta, works in IT but is really into the history of wrecks. She dives and regularly writes about them. It's rare to find women in this business. A man's man and a family man was born in Norway and has a diving shop in the centre of Stockholm. Is an experienced technical diver and hooray, an underwater cameraman. Just what we were looking for. <laughs> the waters outside Stockholm are deeper and more challenging than on the shallower eastern Baltic, giving them many opportunities to hone their skills. If you are enthusiastic enough, not even the ice or winter stops you from diving. Tor took down the camera for some under ice images. We 
are outside a pretty residential island, there are a couple of wrecks here in a shallow water that the divers go to see regularly. This is not only ice diving, it's also town centre diving. We never thought we could do this in such a civilised manner. The water was really murky today, so we concentrated on the surface pictures. This often happens in the Baltic. The visibility can be really poor. The divers did a short dive to see the wreck anyway, without the camera. It couldn't have been a more beautiful day. The sun was shining, everyone was having fun. Remember these faces. We'll meet these people again soon. They are going to be our main diving team in this series, sharing their stories, doing expeditions and spending time with us at the Baltic. What are you doing in the pond? It's a glass point of view. The next trick they will make will be Narvik. They will send us some great video footage from there. Soon it will be summer and we'll spend more time together. While the team were busy diving, Charlotta has organised us to visit the Vasa. Without a doubt, the most impressive maritime museum in the whole world is the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. This purpose-built museum houses a famous wreck of the 17th century warship. It's nice in the summer, but we were there in the winter time. Vasa is a massive Swedish warship that sunk in the center of Stockholm on her maiden voyage in 1628. You could say that Vasa is the very own Titanic of Sweden. Just maybe the words most powerful or unsinkable should never be used when you're building a ship. Vasa lay at the bottom of the sea in an amazingly good condition for 330 years before she was found, raised, restored and displayed in all her glory for everyone to admire. We went to meet two enthusiastic Vasa experts. We'll let them introduce themselves. General public are not allowed on board, but we got special permission. Well, I'm Fred Hawker. I'm the head of research here at the Vasa Museum. Uh, I've been here for two and a half years. Before that, I was an archaeologist for the National Museum of Denmark. and Before that, a professor at Texas A&M University, where I taught maritime archaeology. If you're a maritime archaeologist, there is no more amazing project you could work on than this one. My name is Paul Tukhoglund. I work at the Swedish Maritime Museum as an underwater archaeologist, specializing in ships from Swedish great age of power, 17, 18 centuries. The ship was built um, in a relatively short time, just a couple of years, in the 1620s. Uh, Gustav Adolf, who was the king of Sweden in those days, wanted, needed to expand his navy because he was engaged in a new kind of amphibious warfare. At the same time, he wanted to demonstrate to his rivals, uh, mostly Christian IV of Denmark and his cousin Sigismund in Poland, that he was the most powerful king in the Baltic. And one way to do that in that period, if you were a great king, you had to have a great navy with great ships. And so he had Vasa built to be the most powerful ship in the Baltic. Uh, and they didn't quite get the balance right. So when the ship sailed, it was very unstable. There was too much weight high up in the ship. And uh, about 1,500 meters into its maiden voyage, a gust of wind heeled it over to one side. The gun ports were open so they could fire a salute. Water ran in through the gun ports on the port side and went to the bottom like a stone. It was about 100 meters offshore, maybe 150 meters offshore, and there were a lot of small boats that were following the ship because it was the maiden voyage. It was on its way down to its squadron station out in the archipelago. Uh, and so all those small boats rushed in and picked people up. And the ship's masts were still above the water, and so people could hang onto them rigging until they could be rescued if they couldn't swim. 
about 30 people died. Vasa isn't exceptionally wrong constructed. No, right. it's, it's typically built for its time. Yeah. The ships at the time were very unstable. By, you know, by our standards. And a lot of ships sank because of that. But Vasa sank uh, very early. Right. Which is fortunate for us. I mean, the, they tried to salvage the ship. And in the 1660s, they actually used uh, divers and a diving bell and managed to recover all but three of the ship's uh, 64 guns. Voss is an early attempt to have two full gun decks. I mean, there weren't any ships with two full gun decks much before Voss. Um, but eventually, that was settled on as the optimum solution in something that was called the 74 gun ship. But that took until about about 1750 before they'd come up with a, the right combination of size and the number and type of guns to make it work. Vasa paradoxically provided a key piece of that experience. That there was, a, there was an inquest afterwards uh, and one of the things that they were trying to get to the bottom of was of course whose fault it was, who could be punished, but also to get to some understanding of what the problem was with the idea that it, you would not repeat that same mistake. And we know for example that Vasa's you could sort of say sister ship, a vessel of the same size and armament that was built at about the same time, served in the fleet for 30 years and was deliberately sunk as a blockage at the end of that time. So that they did, you can say, they did learn from this experience. You didn't reckon how powerful or important a warship was by its physical size. It was what kind of armament it carried. And Voss's armament is what made it so powerful. Two full decks of 24-pounder cannon. If, if you're going to have a, a, an inquest today under the current rules of maritime law and responsibility, we have enough knowledge to say who would be blamed today, and that would be the captain, for two things. They conducted a stability test of the ship before it sailed, and they realized that the ship was not stable, dangerously unstable as a matter of fact. But the Navy had accepted the ship anyway, and the captain had accepted the ship and sailed it. If the gun ports on the lower gun deck had been closed, the ship probably would not have sunk that day. There was a civilian engineer who worked for the Swedish Navy named Anders Fransen, who was very interested, like a lot of naval officers in that period were, uh, in the history of the Swedish Navy. And one of the ones he was most interested in was Vasa. Um, and there were historical documents that indicated approximately where the ship sank. So he started searching the area using a homemade coring device. It was a plummet, essentially a, a punch on the end of a weight that he would drop over the side and then see what stuck in the punch. And he searched the area off of Beckholm and Island systematically doing this until he hit an area where he was getting plugs of wood, of black oak, waterlogged oak in the coring device. Two divers went down and uh, one actually ended up on the ship and the other ended up next to it and reported that he was up against a huge wooden wall with square holes cut in it. And he was a, his name was Per Edvin Felting, and he was the Swedish Navy's chief salvage diver. There isn't any other known warship that sank in Stockholm Harbor that would fit that description, except Mosa. It, it wasn't an archeological project, it was a salvage project to raise the ship and conserve it and put it on display, um, driven initially by the, by the Swedish Navy all of the Navy's divers had to do an annual checkout dive. And they, the Navy simply decreed that that checkout dive would be working on Vasa. What they planned to do was refloat it. And so they had to block up all the gun ports and the stern castle here behind us. This had all collapsed and been torn off by an anchor that had been dragged through the ship probably in the, in the 20th century. And so they had to close in that area so it would be watertight. So they built a new transom around the ship and a little bit at the bow. And the last big thing they raised was the, the ship's boat. The big ship's boat, 12 meter flat bottom boat. The conservation took about 17 years, just the conservation of the wood. To, to spray it with polyethylene glycol and then another nine years to dry it out after that. The restoration process went on with the conservation process. One of the things that is unique and powerful about this particular find 
because there isn't anywhere else that you can go and see essentially a complete original warship from the days of sail. I mean, if you go to see Victory in England, you're not actually seeing Nelson's Victory. You're seeing a lot of new oak and teak that has replaced Nelson's Victory. Or if the same with USS Constitution in Boston or any of the other old wooden ships. What you're seeing here is you're seeing the original ship, at least 95% of it. And that has a very powerful effect on your imagination. I mean, we work here, we see it every day, and it's still, every time I come into the ship hall, I get that oh wow moment. But I can see how just standing next to it, it can affect your imagination that powerfully to give you that, that sense of place and that sense of a past time. The Vasa Museum attracts 850,000 visitors from all over the world each year. No wonder, Vasa is breathtaking. Stockholm has been called the Venice of Scandinavia, which sounds rather grand and is almost true. The waterways have always played an important part in the history of this town. Many ships have sailed these waters and also many have sunk. The centre of Stockholm is literally full of wrecks. The town itself is built on 14 islands and situated between the Big Lake Malaren and the Baltic Sea. The first building in Stockholm was a fortification for the purpose of controlling the traffic between the Baltic Sea and the Malaren. This is the Baroque-style castle of the popular Swedish royal family. The castle is for official use only and open for public. Just like in London, the changing of guards is a popular tourist pastime. The guard dates back to the early 16th century. Stockholm became a Hanse town in the 13th century. The German Hanseatic League was a trading monopoly in the Baltic Sea area. It remained a commercial association, not a political one. The League offered protection and privileges to its member towns and negotiated toll breaks with trading partners such as the City of London. The member towns prospered, which can still be detected in the impressive medieval architecture. And of course, one of the local attractions is this, the beautiful Swedish girls, and they seem to know that. The city of Stockholm has spread far beyond the small islands of the old town, but it's a beautiful place to see, and one of our favourite towns, full of narrow cobbled alleyways, shops, restaurants and bars, old churches and medieval town squares. These pretty scenes hide many bloody battles, mostly against the Danish rule and mostly about the supremacy of the Baltic Sea trading routes. The dispute between Sweden and Denmark went on for hundreds of years. We start getting webcam reports from the Swedish diving team. They have dived steam cargo ship Olga Stussen just outside Stockholm. Hi Kimo. Hi Kimo. Antonia. <laughs> this is uh, the first attempt to actually make the, the voiceover thing we talked about. Olga Stussen. It lays uh, in the Baltic, a couple of miles north of Stockholm. Mm -hmm. It's a um, steam engine yeah. cargo ship. Mm -hmm. Like normal size, they are mostly between like 60 or 60 to 75 meters. The depth is like 50, around 50 meters. It's a really nice wreck to die because the visibility is often really good. The wreck lays on like a shelf on the bottom that is like a little over 50 meters maybe 55 meters deep and on the sides there's a really steep drop off down to like over 100 meters so the thing is that really cold fresh water are pushed up from, from the deep part uh, over the wreck yeah. and that's why the visibility is so good because usually in that this part of the Baltic the visibility is pretty bad maybe a couple of meters but here you can have like 20 meters and the current on the on the wreck can be really bad it can be so bad like you have to 
drag yourself on the, on the boat to mm -hmm. actually move. But on this side we use the scooters, the underwater scooters, as you see. Which, no. which helps a lot during them because we have like no problem, problem at all in scootering against the car. You can see a big uh, extra reserve propeller. Most of these ships carried an extra propeller on uh, the ship with them all the time. This was because um, most of the time they were specially made, measured for uh, that right. specific ship. Yeah. So there are kind of quite a lot of like personal stuff still on the boat, like uh, stuff left by the by the crew when they left the boat. It was not us, but uh, this other guy that we know, he found actually a wallet inside one of the cabins. And inside the wallet there was this wedding ring yeah. with an inscription uh, of one of the crew members who actually died during the... The sink. Yeah, the sink. Oh. Right. So he wrote that name up and he is actually right now trying to find out if there are any relatives left for... It's a pretty cool story. So everybody fill their own tanks or? Most of the time I end up doing two tanks. Tor, Per and Lotta show us how the Trimix gases are mixed and the bottles filled. Unlike in the traditional diving with air tanks, the technical divers need different mixes for different depths. You can catch fire, like in the valves and in the tanks, so that would be a pretty bad experience, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We're all leaking. Yeah. We're all up on our ground. Oh, what do you think? I'm gonna take this in the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> We just pan pipe. <laughs> <laughs> this is more fun than feeling times outside. It's helpful to us to see the huge amount of gear they need. Let's check the leak. No leak. The team is preparing for a diving trip to Narvik, Norway. There they will dive a few wrecks, including a Second World War Nazi German U boat, U711, and its supply ship, Black Watch. It takes a lot of preparations to go diving with this team. <laughs> While the diving team travels to Norway, Tanya and Kimo join Yari in Tallinn, Estonia. Yari is on his way back from the meeting with the Maritime Museum. For all the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, the latest and successful bid for freedom and independence only happened in 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet rule. The change was peaceful and was called the Singing Revolution because of the spontaneous rallying of ordinary people. In Estonia, about 300,000 people, one third of the population, attended one singing gathering in Tallinn. In the hotel, Kimo, Yari and Tanya catch up on the project progress. While the trip to Sweden was a success, Yari has his doubts about the possible cooperation from the Estonian Maritime Museum. They seemed uncertain about giving us information, or helping us find the U-boat wreck, or renting us their research ship, Mari. 
We later found out that the Estonians had already agreed to help an American filming crew at the Baltic Sea the same summer. Maybe this affected their willingness to cooperate. And here's the famous Lembit and research ship Mari. Lembit was going through renovation before its return to its current use as a museum ship. During the Soviet rule, private citizens were not allowed to die of the local wrecks. One exception to this rule was a legendary Estonian diver and wreck hunter, Bela Mas, seen here with the submarine Lembit in the summertime. Before leaving Tallinn, we visit the Tallinn harbour Pavita, where the submarine Lembit usually is moored. No sight of Lembit, no sight of summer, no research boat. We seem to have hit a brick wall. Feeling a bit sorry for ourselves, it's time to say goodbye to Tallinn for now and take a ferry to Helsinki. Far away from Estonia, our diving team and their friends are doing well in Narvik. Per and Lotte tell us via webcam how the dive on the Second World War German U-boat U711 went. This boat is very much like the U479 we are looking for. They also tell about the supply ship Black Watch. Divers, they, their biggest dream is actually to dive a U-boat. It's kind of hard to understand if you watch the film. It's like a tube. It's nothing. <laughs> the cool thing with it is like it's a teak deck, uh, and the, the the deck was still in place. Yeah. And you can see the propeller, you can see the tower and some stuff, and that's about it. Yeah. In this little harbour north of Nordic, the Germans had this service ship, or what is it it's called? What's yeah, it? supply ship. Supply ship, good. Uh, where the, the seamen could, they could have a rest, they could like watch a move, they could have like good food. And the story is they probably even can get themselves a woman or something on that ship. Because mm. that's the story about the Black Watch. Mm. The supply ship they have like actually prostitutes on the ship. But um, so all the crew members on the U-boat were actually on the, the, the supply ship, the Black Watch, when the, the English bomb plane came and bombed the hell out of Black Watch. Mm. Like, direct hit with bombs. Yeah. So but some of the maybe two or three of the crewmen on the U-boat managed to get back to the U-boat and like pull the plug more or less. So they actually sank it themselves. Exactly. So it, it, it wasn't hit by anything, but it was sunk on purpose mm. by the Germans. The interesting thing was when we were diving here, mm. one old woman and a man, they were out fishing, and uh, she was 16 years old when she witnessed the whole scenario of the, the sinking of the Black Watch and, and the Germans sinking their own uh, U-boat and, and uh, wounded soldiers getting washed up on shore and uh, she was trying to save, of course, the ones that she could save. So she was an old woman now, and, and it was, she was out fishing cod, and, and they, they They came up to the us. dive boat, yeah. and like, oh, how are you diving the U-boat? <laughs> and they know exactly yeah. where the U-boat was. So they, they wanted really, they were really eager to, to watch the film, the, the shots from the U-boat, and she went like, all quiet. Yeah. And if, was crying, if we would have had two cameras, because now we, we lent her the camera to watch the film from the U-boat, but if we would have had an extra camera, it would have been great to film her when she was watching the underwater footage from the U-boat, mm. because you she could see... She was so see, touched. Yeah. 
emotionally touched by that. So we are back in Helsinki, capital of Finland, and Kimo's old hometown. The research would continue from here. We'll have meetings with the Finnish Maritime Museum and other experts. These views are from a small island and local recreational park. And there's also the reminder that the Baltic Sea is an important commercial link between all these countries and beyond. Helsinki is also a working harbour. The Swedish divers are doing well in Narvik. Next they are diving the German U-boat supply ship, Black Watch. This is actually my my own premiere of video no, photography, photography. That's because I was borrowing Tu's camera. He was kind of tired with like dragging it around. So I filmed this wreck, the Black Watch. And that was the supply ship we were talking about mm. just before. The German supply ship that was actually bombed to bits. Mm. Uh, it's pretty broken up, but it's it's really shallow. It's like from 20 meters down to 45. So you have a Quite a quite a good quite good uh, surface. You can see cars uh, being floating on the different valves and. No, stuff. actually filming the 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 cannon. Oh yeah. You know we have the divers penetrate. Uh, some of the superstructure yeah. direct where it's swimming one of the windows. It's, cool, it's kind of cool, if I can say it myself, it's one of the best penetration <laughs> shots we took inside this wreck. Yeah. Diving inside wrecks is a dangerous business and similar to cave diving. All the divers in this team are also experienced cave divers. It was a great dive. Yeah, and there you can see actually walk and practicing some uh, dive skills on top of a wreck. I hope that's still on the series. <laughs> that's kind of fun. <laughs> The Finnish Maritime Museum is situated at an imposing location on a small island outside Helsinki called, very fittingly, Wreck Island. It's a familiar sight to every ship's captain and boatsman in these waters, a landmark by the Helsinki seaside. You get a good view of Helsinki, the Helsinki archipelago and the famous Finnish icebreakers from here.
We met maritime archaeologist Stefan Vesman. He told us about the Finnish waters. We actually have a lot of known wrecks in Finnish waters. For the moment, we have in our register 1,400 uh, sites underwater. There are other things than wrecks in, in, uh, in that archive. There are some planes and uh, some cars and, <laughs> and other things. Of, of these 1,400 objects, roughly 800 is uh, ancient monuments, old wrecks that are more than 100 year old. For example, in almost all other waters, you have a small uh, mollusk uh, called shipworm that, that is eating and penetrating wood. And, and they can uh, eat a quite large wooden ship in just 20 years or something like that. Then there are some other things that are special in, in the Baltic Sea. For example, these are solid rocks. So when you hit them, you definitely will get a bad leak. And just beside these rocks, you can have up to 40 meters of water. So, so first you hit a rock and get a leak, and then you go down and you go deep. The most destructive uh, phenomenon we, we have here is actually ice. But the ice doesn't go that deep. Uh, in, in, in worst case scenarios you can have ice, pack ice going down to 20 meters, but, uh, but under that the wrecks are pretty safe. In Finnish waters the, the oldest wrecks that we for the moment know about is from the 13th century. We have actually some older uh, parts of, of, of boats in the Finnish lakes. Uh, they have been dated to the Viking Age. And then there are a, a couple of log boats that they are classified a little bit different. They have been dated uh, all the way back to the Stone Age. Uh, there, there is actually one find of a, of a stone, stone Age uh, log boat in the center of Helsinki from Alexis Kivenkatu. Stefan seemed to get especially excited about the prehistoric wrecks. A wreck doesn't get any older than this. The Stone Age log canoe was found by a building team at the centre of Helsinki. The rising landmass in the Helsinki Peninsula has covered the site of an earlier sea bottom. there will always be new opportunity and, and constantly we are finding new wrecks also in our waters here. So, so there is enough job for, for many people here. Our search for a research ship continues. One of the strong candidates is privately owned Ronya. It seems sturdy and spacious. But then we saw Pelagonia and suddenly felt that this is it. It's an old 1930s workboat from the Finnish archipelago that's been in leisure use for a long time. At some point it fell into a state of disrepair and is now being lovingly restored by its current owners. It looks a mess. How will all this be finished in time for our diving trip in a couple of months' time? The owners assure us that it's going to be fine and are happy to rent it to us for the whole month of August. So, that's it, really. We've done the research, found out about the Baltic Sea, the wrecks and the seaside locations. We have a professional diving team and a boat. We pack our bags, cameras and tripods. And our Baltic adventure begins. The whole summer will be spent travelling the countries surrounding the Baltic Sea, visiting locations, meeting experts and diving. And filming everything that happens on the way. The voyage starts from Harwich, under good omens of fine weather. The smooth seas take us to Cuxhaven, Germany. Our 
Our friend Yari flies to nearby Bremen and we drive to pick him up. Our first destination, the U-boat archive near Cook's Harbour. The local naval historians are able to tell us more about the fate of the lost U-boat U-479. At the door, Kimo and Yari are greeted by English-German author and maritime historian, Jak P. Malman Schauel. He has written over 40 books about German U-boats and will be able to help us. Because when you go in, there is a shelf. This, this vast archive is a result of lifelong work by Horst Bredo. As a young man, Mr. Bredo served on the German U-boat. And since then, he has been collecting any information he can get about the history of U-boats and submarines. He's well over 80 years old. His fluent English comes from the time he spent at the American prison camp after the Second World War. Yari and Mr. Bredo talk about the possible collision between Russian submarine Lembit and the German U-boat U-479. It's funny, no? when I started there was almost nothing, almost nothing. You must tell me when I should, when I should start. You can start now. Yeah. Now, you are ready? Yeah. Yes. So, <clears throat> my name is Horst Bredo. I, I'm a former watch officer of, of a German U-boat in the Second World War. And when I came back from prisoner ship, I started to bring together the history of my boat and so started this work in this archive. I never knew, I never thought that it will become such a large size, but now it's done and I'm an old man and I'm working the whole day or eight to ten, ten hours a day and I'm happy to do that. The Swedish diving team dive Erik Giese, a well-preserved wreck of a German destroyer. This is one of you, maybe the only actually totally intact German destroyer in the world. So it's a really exciting dive to do. And you can see already in the first shots that the visibility is really good. And if you compare it to to other scenes from the Baltic, you can actually see that the water is a bit, it's a bit bluer. It was sunk during full battle, and uh, all of the ammunition and stuff was still on, on the boat, and it was so deep so they couldn't salvage stuff at that time. At that depth. Mm -hmm. And it's still leaking oil, actually, so that's one of the reasons it's still prohibited to dive there. Mm -hmm. But we, we got uh, permission to dive and to document it. things you see on the wreck you can of course you probably recognize the, the cannons the destroyers they were equipped with four cannons I guess and also you can see along the railing the depth chargers uh, they look like um, small barrels mm. quite many of them down there mm. uh, as well as a box a mystery box we don't know what it contains but uh, you can see one of the divers shining his light on it. Mm. We didn't open it, we thought it could be an ammunition. You can see the big propellers in there. You can see also the angle of the propeller blades. Uh, it's a very high speed uh, ship. So it's a really impressive boat and a really impressive dive to do. 
As you see, it's, it's, it's a more or less totally intact wreck. We're getting to the torpedo tube. Yeah, the torpedoes were shot by. They were shot from the torpedo tubes gone by compressed air mm. just over the railing of the boat and then when landing in the water it's, it's propelled with soft water propelled. The bridge, uh, it got a few direct hits, yeah. I can't remember how many, but uh, that's the only part of the ship that's really damaged. Mm. The wind was pretty strong and we also had a current because uh, yeah, right. to it deal with the, the tide. The tide. The biggest problem was that we didn't have enough line to tie the boat in, so we were it was at a very kind of steep, steep angle. angle thing, right. The pressure on the line was so big, and I could see the line vibrating. You could see the strain on the line, it was like <laughs> vibrating really hard. Yeah. So, at least Lotta realized the second before it broke that this is going to break. Yeah. So I just gave a sign for uh, shooting a... The boy, we the boy. Have that is attached to a line, yeah. so we can do the ascent on the new line, the new up line. To the boy, and the boy makes us visible to the boat, so they can like drive around and protect us from yeah. from the big dangerous boats. Yeah. So, so it, it, it worked went fine. it went fine, but it was a couple of scary minutes before. Like we are looking for any information about the lost U-boat U-479 that sank in the Finnish waters at the Baltic Sea at the end of the Second World War. The archive has all the logbooks of all the U-boats. You see, each day. The U-boat command lists where every U-boat was. So you can, with this, reconstruct the history of any U-boat which was lost. Yes. But what is also interesting is with some boats, the pages are missing. An admiralty had taken out those significant pages. Where something happened. Where something had obviously happened that admiralty mm. didn't want us to know about because these were captured by the British after the British and Americans after the war. Well, why? Obviously something there. Yeah, there's some, there's some mystery there. Mm. And probably a sunken ship as well. The U-479 logbook, that if you can see it as a microfilm, that would be very interesting to see how that ends. Author Jack P. Malman Schauel lives in England but he spends a lot of time in Germany doing research for his books. After a quick search, we find traces of the lost U-boat and even a photo of it. Oh, there is one. Yeah, it's in the back. Yeah, yeah, it says in Helsinki, 1944. It was sunk on the 12th of the 12th, 1944, near Ötum, yes. near Torku, um, by the Soviet U-boat Lambert. There you go. Uh, Axel Nieste, who was the expert in what happened to you boats, doesn't name the Lambert. In the absence of a Russian attack to account for its sinking, there is presently no known explanation for its loss. So that also sort of goes well with the story, doesn't it? That goes well with it. Now, we don't know at all what happened to you. No. Seven nine, it, it just vanished. We tried to find a way to give only out, only to give out the facts. Yes. If any diver should find the wreck of this boat, U-479, he, he shouldn't go into the boat because it is a, it is a war grave. War grave. Mm. Yes. But how can they identify the boat without going in it? Not, not possible. It's not possible. What, the, what happened to the U, U-479? Yeah. Yeah, I can't answer it because... Yeah. Well, you have answered it. You've said that we don't know. The future of the archives is currently uncertain. Horst Bredo is not a young man anymore. One interested party for keeping up the archives and collections is the town of Kuxar, and there are plans for opening a museum for this purpose. The Second World War era German history is still controversial but the archives is definitely a valuable asset to writers, students and historians.